Hi, my name is Scott Ambler. I'm one of the authors of Disfinancial Delivery from IBM Press. My other co-author is Mark Lines of UpMentors. The goal I would like to share with you now is that Disfinancial Delivery is goal-driven. So what my co-author Mark and I have noticed over the years working with various customers around the world is that Agile teams uh, are flexible. Uh, they, they find themselves in many different situations and they need to tailor their process to meet the actual needs of the situation they find themselves in. So having said, having noticed that, um, we tried to figure out how do we give advice to, uh, to project teams when they're in this wide range of situations. And um, having, uh, frankly, spending several years worrying about that problem, we eventually uh, came to the conclusion that we needed to describe um, the process in terms of goals and not prescribe actual activities and not prescribe exact, exactly what to do. Um, so what we mean by that is that um, so at the beginning of a project, there's some common goals that you need to address. So, for example, you need to um, you probably need to identify some initial requirements and, and come up with a, 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 a technical vision or technical strategy for how you're going to address, um, you know, building this system. Um, you're probably to set up your uh, work environment, form the team, secure funding and other basic fundamental things. Now, there's many different ways you can achieve those goals. Um, so, for example, if um, we're trying to um, bring stakeholders to agreement around a vision, for example, you know, maybe we'll send out an email to everybody. Maybe we'll hold a meeting. Maybe we'll, um, maybe you know, maybe we'll um, get them to vote via some survey or something. So, there's there's several different ways we can do that, and there's trade-offs and advantages to each one. Um, similarly, there's um, uh, common goals throughout construction. We should incrementally produce a potentially consumable solution, for example. We should uh, address our stake changing stakeholder needs and so on. At the end of the at the end of the life cycle, when we're transitioning our solution in production, we have to you know, obviously we have to deploy the solution, but we also have to ensure that it's production ready, that the, the operations and support people can actually take it on, that it's going to work while it's in production. So we have to rerun our regression test suite and so on. So there's these common goals that we need to address uh, throughout the life cycle, um, and our approach should be flexible. So let's work through a couple of examples um, to see what I mean. So, for example, um, as I said, one of the uh, one of the goals at the beginning of a project is to identify the initial requirements, and you know there's some simplistic solutions out there. You know, write a stack of index cards. You know, just capture a bunch of user stories. Um, but the reality is that there is, there's a little more to it than that. And you know, we, we in many ways we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater when we um, you know produce these simplistic solutions. So the reality is, so let's step back and let's observe uh, empirically. Let's observe what what agile teams are actually doing and what issues are they addressing. So one of the issues that they have to address is well, who should they work with? Should they be working with a stakeholder proxy such as a product owner or a, a business analyst? Should they be working with end users? Should they be working with senior managers of those end users, um, regulatory people, enterprise architects, um, other IT people? Should they be working with operations and support people? So this wide range of stakeholders and there's this um, and a range of potential people representing those stakeholders that they may have to work with and different teams will um, find themselves in different situations with different classifications of stakeholders and that's perfectly fine um, what types of models should they create so you know or you know should they create user stories should um, should they address usage concerns in other ways so for example um, you know maybe they should write use cases maybe they should write usage um, scenarios Maybe they should uh, be doing user interface prototypes. Maybe they should be doing data models. Maybe they should create some uh, process diagrams. Maybe they should create um, a wireframe diagram overviewing how the how the screens fit together. Um, so there's a, a, a bunch of potential artifacts that they might want to create um, with advantages and disadvantages to each. And there's these different views that each type of these uh, artifacts address. So because there's different views that you want to address, you're going to have to have a, a collection of models and not just a stack of index cards. Um, well, what level of detail should you go to? I mean, that's another valid question. Um, some Agile teams actually um, create very deep, you know, for whatever reasons, they create very detailed um, requirement specifications. Um, more commonly, they, they, they do just do, in fact, just do a stack of index cards and maybe some whiteboard sketches. Um, some teams have very slim uh, requirements definitions. So, for example, they might just have a list of goals and that'll be, that'll be good enough for them. Um, so there's different levels of detail, each of which have um, advantages and disadvantages. Um, how long should you invest in this is, a, is another valid question. So, you know, do we spend a couple hours, you know, some teams will spend a few hours and that'll be enough. Some teams will spend a few days, a few weeks, sometimes even a few months uh, 
some of the, particularly at scale, um, you often um, do have to invest a fair bit of time at the beginning of a project to figure out exactly what it is that you're, what the scope is and what you're trying to achieve. So different teams find themselves in different situations. So they'll be doing different things. Um, you know, how she go about doing it? Do we, um, do we hold one-on-one you know, -on -one interviews with people? Do we hire, do um, uh, what's called joint application uh, requirement design sessions? Do we do um, informal impromptu meetings? Um, there's a bunch of different, different ways that you can, you can go about gathering requirements or listing requirements. So, um, and there's trade-offs once again for each of those. So the, the point is, is that there's this goal of identifying the initial scope or identifying the initial requirements or populating the product backlog, if you want to use Scrum terminology. And the, there's different ways you can go about it. And um, there's a bunch of different issues that you have to address. And what happens, what we've done in the book is we're not going to tell you exactly, you know, thou shalt just write user stories and everything will be fine. That, that's, that's sort of naive. Um, what we do is we walk you through these issues. We walk you through your options. We walk you through the important trade-offs that you're making. You know, we'll give you some suggestions what we what we prefer, but we're not going to say thou shalt do this. We're not going to prescribe an exact technique, but we will provide you with the advice to make these important process decisions and hopefully tailor the dispenager delivery process to, to meet your actual needs. So um, this, I think, is a, a far more robust way of approaching the, um, the agile software methodology. So um, something to, that I think you know, some people, a lot of people are going to enjoy. A few people will be um, a little offended that we're not telling them exactly what to do, but you know that's okay. Another example would be, you know, how do you address you know, changing stakeholder needs? So throughout the project, um, your stakeholders will change their minds. They'll come up with new requirements. They'll come up with new ideas. Um, how do you address that? So in in Scrum, they have this concept called a product backlog, which is a great concept. The idea is that you've got this. Uh, this ordered list of requirements, this ordered stack or queue of requirements, and that you you work on them in in, in order, often in you know, business value order, but um, you know be that as it may. So it's a very good good way of working, um, but that's not the only way of working. So you know one very obvious and easy observation that you can make is that well we do more than just implement requirements on projects. We also fix defects, and particularly if you happen to be working on a team. That's uh, not only developing a new release of the system, but you're also the, the, the level three support team for the existing version of the systems already up and running in production. You'll be getting production defects coming in that, you, that you're expected to fix. So those, in effect, are, are new work items that should be on your stack. Um, because you're in, in this organizational ecosystem um, that, uh, and you're only one of many teams, um, you might be getting asked to do work to help other teams. So, for example, um, you might be asked to, you know, your team might be asked to review some of the work of my team. Um, your team might get asked to, to help my team out with some database work because we don't have a lot of database expertise on our, on our team right now. So these sorts of things happen. And so the, all, the, all this sort of work needs to be, be prioritized and managed. Um, or you, you know, maybe you're taking a, a more of a lean approach where instead of working as a work queue, um, you instead uh, have like an options pool. Um, so where there's um, several different ways that the work is being prioritized or being being managed, and that you you pull the work out when you have uh, when you have capacity to do it. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that there's more than one way to manage your stakeholder, your, your changing stakeholder needs, your changing stakeholder requirements on a project. So instead of just saying, you know, let's just do product backlogs or let's just do work item queues or whatever, um, in DAD, we say, well, here's your option. Here's some very good options. Here's the trade-offs. Here's the issues you need to, need to consider. Um, you pick the right approach for the situation you find yourself in. Um, so I think this is a, a, a more mature, a more robust way of looking at uh, the software process. So anyways, thank you very much for taking your time to, uh, to listen to me uh, uh, talk about Dispenagil Delivery. Um, if you want to get more involved or want to find out more about the book, um, drop by www.disciplinedagildelivery.com uh, where we have a, uh, an ongoing blog, an ongoing conversation about the, about the process framework and, and the book itself. So thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day and I hope you've uh, gotten something of value out of this video. Thank you.